for those that are watching that maybe aren't familiar with you, I, I wanted to just give a, a brief bio so that they understand who you are and, and what you've contributed to the crypto community in general. Sure. So, um, and, and I'm not going to, I won't take a long time, but, you know, I understand you come from a technology background and your focus really is on advocacy within the cryptocurrency sector, which we all appreciate. Um, you started in 2010, but really got, went full time into supporting and advocating for cryptocurrency communities in 2015. And you've been heavily involved with in four different blockchains. Is that, is that correct? Yes, I've been I've been uh, uh, supportive in teams, both from an advisory level, a technical level, um, and as time has progressed from a developmental level um, over that time. So yes, four four different teams. That's fantastic. I um, which can you, would you mind sharing with us which community gave you the the moniker the voice. Uh, that's an old defunct community. That community, I have to remember back which name it went by. Um, at one point, it went by the name Obsidian, um, but wow. uh, I think it later on changed its name. I had moved on after that point. They did a they did a, a focus on privacy. Uh, excuse me, not privacy, anonymity. Their whole goal was anonymity and transactions and and anonymity in users. And um, of course, some of those didn't really go over so well during that 2017, 2018, 2019 timeframe. So exchanges really weren't supportive of that kind of environment, which is why Monero quite often has problems. But yeah, yeah. That's, That's fascinating. Time ago. Mm -hmm. What I appreciate about yourself is I know your learning has all been self-directed and you really approach things, you, you understand the technology very well, but you're able to communicate it in layman's terms and uh, help people understand why it's important. And I think that ties into what we're talking about today because the conversation today, I'd like to talk about the Divi blockchain, just sort of getting back to the fundamentals and understanding what's special about this blockchain that we have you know, if, if the casual crypto investor is, is looking at the Divi project right now, they, they're going to, the first thing we all look at is the chart and they're not going to see a lot of activity going on, but it sounds like you're still very much of the belief that Divi not only is alive and well, but that it, it's a great platform for aspiring web three developers. And I uh, want to understand a little bit more about that and, and just what makes it special specifically from maybe that how it was designed as a pure proof of stake coin and so forth. Well, sure. And, and uh, just a little preface there in my background, I am totally not technically trained. And so it is all self-directed education. So that's probably that's why I can simplify some of those concepts that are complicated and use analogies that are a little bit more blue collar esque if we want to use that terminology. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. What, what, what is Divi or what makes Divi separate from other currencies? Well, I would say, um, it was philosophy in the beginning, right? So philosophy is not a technology. It's not even a goal, it's more or less the directionality of whatever your vision would be. You, and you, you have a goal that may be in that roadmap, but you, if you have a philosophy, you can move that goal, change that goal as long as it doesn't fit that philosophy. And so Divi started off with a philosophy um, and that was crypto participation or crypto made easy. And that's what endeared me to it. Um, now you're talking about future, uh, future, the philosophy is still present. Um, the technology has dramatically changed. What Divi had early on really wasn't much different than several blockchains or many blockchains that launched in 2017, 2018 timeframe, mainly because we, we all share some heritage. Um, we share heritage with other blockchains. Most blockchains share some heritage um, with Bitcoin, right? And so they may be directly uh, 
children spawned off of Bitcoin, like Litecoin. Um, that would be one. Um, but in other cases, there are other blockchains that have branched off and maybe you could call them cousins or great grandchildren, whatever you would do. Um, and Divi is, is like that. There's a lot of Bitcoin in Divi. There is a lot of other proof of stake blockchains in Divi. And early on, it was philosophically different. And from a community standpoint and participation um, and engagement, it was very, very different than standard blockchain. So it sort of embraced a much, much broader community uh, of adoption was the goal. And, and that was all the, the philosophy from the founders. Today, technologically speaking, um, it's a very different blockchain. And where before it wasn't necessarily a pure proof of stake, today it is. Um, and that, that sort of begs to question, well, what is proof of stake or what is proof of work? Um, I think your statement about Web3 lends to the reason why we are pro pure proof of stake. And that is because of the stability of the blockchain. And that allows certain things to um, be applied to the blockchain because of its extreme stability that make this Web3 initiative possible. So that's a, a sort of a decentralized Web3, where Web3 really isn't decentralized currently. Can, um, can so, I ask you yeah, a question? <clears throat> I want to know a little bit more about this, this idea of, a, of stability, because I know mm -hmm. the Divi blockchain... Oh man, when did we mint our first block? Was it 2018? Yeah, it was just, uh, September of 2018. And it's been, I mean, it's been running consistently and stably ever since. Yeah, you could say uh, running stably is correct. You could say running stably for most blockchains that are true blockchains, right? A, a blockchain shouldn't stop unless all the participants stop using it, right? That would be, right. or supporting it, it wouldn't stop. There shouldn't be a team who can stop a blockchain, those kinds of things. Um, where I would agree with you from the surface level, when you look at your, you know, history, it looks extremely stable, but from an, from an actual uh, an analysis and historical point of view, no, there's been extreme instabilities and when I, when I make the statement of instabilities, it's all about consensus. And consensus is where every person agrees this is the data at this point in time. And there has been cases of consensus um, where those opinions have split. And at least for a short time, there is um, a disagreement in, in the blockchain. And, and for us... Um, that happened because of a certain technology called masternodes. And masternodes themselves were originally put in place to in increase stability. Um, but uh, for reasons that we now understand, um, which Bitcoin actually adheres to, is anything that you add to a blockchain and you extend something over the top of the blockchain, but it's not actually on the blockchain, but can influence the blockchain, that's not a good idea. And so that's why we're pure, pure proof of stake today. Um, masternodes uh, were set up as a secondary layer of validation from what would have been miners, we would call them stakers, same position, same title, same kind of work. Validators is, is, the, is the true category for that, whether it's Bitcoin or whether it's a mining proof of stake algorithm. Um, and the validators themselves were subservient or second class to the masternodes, meaning that they could do the work of validating a block, but a masternode may have a, a, a different opinion on who might have earned the masternode reward or, or anything in that block. And they could, they could overwrite the opinion and share a different opinion. And that could influence other validators. I and see you again get a split because some follow one group of masternodes and some might follow that other group. So that's why um, your other questions in here are types of proof of stake. 
and we'll get to those. But I think that's probably, I just hit on the point of anything that's external, anything that's extra, any, any added element you add to a blockchain, it increases complexity. And masternodes were another level, not even on the blockchain, but a separate network. And that increases the complexity. And when you do that, there's vectors of attacks or there's instability, even if the intention is good. Um, you have to be prepared for those kinds of things. So yeah, it wasn't as stable as we would have just thought. But when you look at the blockchain, I can I can show you sometimes some instabilities that were there, but it's night and day difference today. So most people wouldn't know. <laughs> but we do. So I was reading through the Bitcoin white paper again yesterday and just just working to understand what Satoshi Nakamoto originally wrote about mm -hmm. proof of work. And mm -hmm. he addresses conflicts where maybe two validators or two two nodes have they both mine, I guess, mine the same block same at the block. same time. Mm -hmm. And then um how that conflict would be resolved. Correct. So the fundamentally, aside from CPU power versus just number of coins, it mm -hmm. is proof of stake and proof of work. It, does it is the technology the same behind both? Aside from how the authority is determined, it depends. I would say that when we say proof of work, we have a pretty clear picture of proof of work. When we say proof of stake. Um, it's a pretty broad term. It, it, it is one that if you speak to one blockchain, they will use the term or the statement of proof of stake one way, and another blockchain may use it another way. And then there's layers of types of proof of stake. And there are um, situations to where I would say what you just said is true, that after a certain point, everything is similar um, and certain blockchains will always follow that and in other blockchains and there are thousands of them out there right um, they're going to have some other layer some other addition some other opinion on how you get to that same consensus and again masternodes uh, which and masternode blockchains even today have had troubles with that sort of consensus because you're adding another layer another opinion in, in the blockchain and um, it changes. So yes, if you looked at, let's say we'll use Divi as the example in proof of work, obviously you and I are competing. We have computers, um, maybe computers that are specialized for the process of mining. Sure. And this is probably best stated in, in an early state in Bitcoin, but we would have a, a miner and, um, and it would compete um, to earn the ability to uh, mine the block and create what's called a Coinbase. Coinbase, um, like the name of the company, Coinbase is where a Bitcoin miner actually creates the Bitcoin. Divi and Bitcoin both have Coinbases. And so a validator who's mining a block using its proof of the stake that it has um, creates a Coinbase transaction. So yeah, that would be the same. And in Divi today, in Bitcoin, um, both blockchains after a certain point are looking at the person who did the work in the block, where Divi is not a proof of work, it's a pur pure proof of stake. Um, the output of the work that that validator did um, is data stored on the blockchain and it shows what their effort was in in the case of bitcoin you can see the amount of work um in what would be a category called bits and those bits are all related to the, how hard it is to mine the block and what they put into it and in divi it's the same so it's the bits but it's not necessarily how much electricity they pulled out of the wall um, it would be what their coin stake was that was utilized to mine the block as far as a multiplier. And so both of them require an investment. You have to buy a miner and miners can cost thousands or maybe tens of thousands. Or um, it could be if you're operating a mining pool, could be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. 
in cryptocurrencies that have more or less a proof of stake algorithm, you don't have to necessarily buy specialized machinery, but you have to own a stake in the network. Yeah. So does so does proof of stake for a, a lower market cap coin present an easier target for, let's say, an attacker to try to gain a majority of the shares? Because, I mean, obviously it would require millions of dollars. I, guess, I suppose that's where the incentive comes in. Um, why would an attacker want to buy up the majority? But it, is it, I, I suppose the question is, is there more risk in proof of stake versus proof of work or, or uh, just different risk? It's, it's different. Um, I, I think that where you have the um, proof of work, on not on a blockchain like Bitcoin, but on a new blockchain um, that's young, that has few participants, a computer machinery can be reconfigured in, in many cases, not all cases, to mine different networks. Obviously, that happened in Ethereum. That has happened in, in proof of work, in Bitcoin forks, where somebody has tried to take over the network by doing that. It happens in really small blockchains. Uh, there is no investment change other than the time to upload or reconfigure your software. And that's where it really... You know, you talk about uh, attack surfaces and those kinds of things. That's where it really is really fundamentally standing on the, the, the ground that there's not a lot of people participating right now. <laughs> the more people participating, it's much, much harder. It's still more possible in a proof of stake coin that is using, um, in fact, I would probably say almost any type of proof of stake coin uh, it would be embraced that someone would try. And that might sound weird, but it would be something that I would encourage anyone to attempt to do. Uh, the reason for it would be is this. As a person starts buying up coins, uh, they ultimately put an upward pressure on the value of the coin. And to acquire a large enough uh, amount that would even create some problems in the network, um, they would probably drive the price up to where it would be millions of dollars. Which in turn coin. would attract more buyers. Exactly. And... It, it, it would attract more buyers. It, 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 it really, it creates a competitive aspect. And 51% attacks really aren't applicable in the same way that, uh, let's say, they would be on a proof of work chain. Both chains have... Um, uh, a time frame for or how a depth of blocks in which they do reorganization so to protect against orphans or attacks and those kinds of things so both both systems have protectionary mechanisms in them. and that's why it doesn't really happen it's always talked about as a theory but it doesn't sure. happen because it would take you half the world's hashing power to more than that it would take another world's worth of hashing power to try to play with bitcoin and for a proof of stake coin, it would make every every current coin owner a billionaire. Right. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Maybe we should be encouraging that. That is <laughs> Yeah, we should encourage it. Exactly. You can try. That would be, that would be, I can try. <clears throat> so I, I I for better or for worse, I use Chat GPT as mm -hmm. uh, a research tool. And sure. I was asking it about different different variations on proof of stake. And yeah, yeah. was reading about delegated proof of stake, leased mm -hmm. proof of stake, bonded proof of stake, uh, proof mm -hmm. of authority. There's even mm -hmm. an Ethereum tool or Ethereum, uh, they, uh, Casper, the friendly finality gadget, which is <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot, and, and and you could, and that's just what ChatGPT knows, right? Some of those, like leased proof of stake, I've read, I've read about long ago don't ask me about it i can't even remember but there are so many different variations of it and most of them are done for the same reason of creating another level of difficulty mm -hmm. and it's to prevent some type of attack or it's to or, or it's to encourage some level of participation it's to make it easier for somebody to to join um Anytime a blockchain does something, again, I'll repeat it, 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 something that's 
extra or on top of consensus, it it changes enough that it increase it, it increases another variable that could be manipulated, right? And so, so we don't we tend not to get on to those kinds of um, ideas for the blockchain. Many of which um, could be considered securities. That's one main thing. So the blockchain developer for Divi is very privacy centered, but he's also very aware of of certain things from a legal aspect as he's coding mathematically, he's looking at it. Um, he's not a lawyer, but of course he's thinking about ownership and sovereignty of ownership, where if you own something, that's one way, but if you give up ownership of something, or at least uh, loan away your ownership in something and give it to somebody else and they then use that something and make profit o uh, on it, it becomes a security. So so many of the things that you have to watch out for in proof of stake are those elements where you're allocating or giving up your coins to another service. And that's why the SEC, obviously we're both in the States, uh, the SEC has called out several, not just a small amount, but quite a few blockchains that do um, types of proof of stake, like a delegated proof of stake, or even a nominated, I think a, a, one of the blockchains was nominated, I could be wrong on that, but delegated proof of stake has been called out because of course, anytime you give up your coins to a, a separate entity, and even if it's an impermanent loss of access, You've given them the ability to use those coins for mining. Um, maybe it's a nominated where the coin holders or the coin holders themselves vote, you know, through, through some sort of an algorithm. Or maybe there is a uh, an election based system built on the blockchain where certain uh, nodes on the network are elected based upon you know tickets kind of like a lottery there's there are different mechanisms for that but ultimately when you pool all of your coins together somebody is running a node and that somebody is profiting in some way if they're excuse me if they're profiting in some way by holding your coins taking a payment and then distributing those coins it's a security at that point in my right. opinion too so and i think in the sec's opinion it's a security. So we stay off of those kinds of technologies. Well, and I appreciate that because I have seen some of the legal challenges people have faced. So Divi is, is not, in your opinion, obviously neither of us are attorneys, but in no. your opinion, Divi's not at risk of getting caught up in that SEC um, label? Not, not in anything that I spoke about, right? Obviously the SEC can... <laughs> anyone for anything if they see right. you um you know so it's it's always about whether you're a business or a blockchain and you're a nascent technology a new technology or a new type of business if you get the eyes of anybody on you it could be could be problematic but no i don't see any problem with that so um i certainly don't see any problem with a, a coin owner maintaining their own ownership at all times. I think that's probably one of the number one things that I would advocate for is coin owners never, I should say, um, try not to participate where you would keep your coins in other person's hands, other entities hands, exchanges included. Um, but to be cautious, I would say on certain types of algorithms, where you have to give up ownership of, of your tokens, at least for a certain amount of time. And it may be trustless, you know, because it's part of a contract maybe, but is it totally trustless? And the answer is no. Most contracts, when you give up your coins, there is a person who owns keys, or maybe it's an algorithm that dispersed keys. There is an entity, there is something that's controlling those assets, how they're dispersed. And if there's people behind it and they have your coins, then then it gets kind of on slippery slope. I wouldn't want to defend that. <laughs> it just seems right. problematic. Well, and that's if one the, of the SEC gets on it, then of course, what happens to your value of your coin? Right. That's what I'm grateful for with the Divi project and the philosophy behind 
the people that have built it is um, that you can stake and earn without giving yeah. up custody. And I know we've had right. opportunity to participate in liquidity pools and there have been other, other things, uh, yield farming and people participate in some of that stuff. But I've always just been grateful to run my master node or now run my staking. Uh, well, I, I'm running a hot wallet, right? Hot I'm wallet, staking yeah. out of the desktop wallet. And there's, there's comfort in knowing that I've got that. I've got the keys. And it's, nobody yeah, else they're does. your keys, right? It's, um, right. well, even in your, when you're in a liquidity pool or any sort of, uh, 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 an algorithm like that, where it's a little bit different is that you're given something in exchange for that. And so that's even, that's even another topic altogether, because usually when you participate in these kinds of pools, you get like a liquidity pool token or something, right? So you put in this and that, and you get something in exchange which represents some value, right? And so right. it's it's a it's a it's a free exchange of tokens and coins for participating and using said other tokens and coins. The problem with those is a lot of people will jump in not realizing that these algorithms have ups and downs and the pairings will change and the value changes. And so what most people read in those is hey, I can make ten thousand percent. If I, if I put in my my tokens and really what they don't read the fine details are you could lose a thousand percent um and right. then and then the funny thing is is that some of the education or influencer style tutorials call that an impermanent loss so it's impermanent it's impermanent as long as you leave them in there and hope that you can wait long enough that they're back up to that same value again so right. it's, it's an impermanent loss yeah yeah, yeah, never I like never invest in anything you can't understand. I think Warren Buffett said that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Some people really like it. It's not my thing though. So that's that's yeah, yeah I, I guess anything is impermanent until you realize the losses. <clears throat> yeah, but, that would be true. If something everything goes up, everything goes down. Um you're in 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 a state where the values of prices have dramatically decreased in some counties um where you are and so yeah so if a person bought a house uh two and a half years ago they paid through the nose if they want to sell that house today they might have lost a hundred thousand dollars right if if that was the goal then maybe that wasn't smart right but usually you buy a house you're going to live in it for five ten twenty thirty years depending upon your work and your family and whatever you're doing but if you're buying it to flip yeah that could be problematic well, let's talk about that because I think that is applicable when you, when you talk about Divi. Divi is a cryptocurrency. Yeah. It, it, and with a currency to be usable, um, y you know, there's, there's some complexity. So I use cryptocurrency for overseas transfers uh, mm -hmm. just as a, you know, logistically, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. But a lot of times... I'm using um, I'm using USDT because it's benchmarked to the US dollar. And so when you're mm -hmm. when you're using a currency, you usually want some sort of like confidence that it's not going to lose value against the things that you're going to buy with that currency, the the goods and services. And so mm -hmm. how does somebody like yourself who who believes in sovereignty of your money and and so forth, how do you reconcile that where you've got a fluctuating asset like Divi or like anything like Bitcoin, which sure. can go or up like to gold. or like gold can go gold, up to 69,000 yeah. Divi and then drop, I mean, sorry, uh, Bitcoin and then drop down to, well, I forget what the low was 16 or something like that. Sure. And now we're back up to in the sixties. Well, I think it depends on what your goals are. If you're transferring fiat values um, and you're looking to, you know, sort of, um, pair that with fiat value you have to think in the moment um if you're not then of course it's not a topic at all but when you're buying something yeah you have to think about that and using divi is usually a pretty good thing as long as it's an in the moment situation it will have a little bit of ups and a little bit of downs uh, just like any other currency will and depending on that time, it could be greatly up or greatly down. We get the benefits. So that I guess I'm going to back up for a second. We get a benefit when it's up. So 
That's what we're excited about. So when, when the currency value is up and I bought or our mind or created that before, I get that elation that I spent less to get something of that value. Um, but then I guess we have the negative, but when it's down, yes, we do experience. I had to give out more. <laughs> I don't want to give out more, but I give out more to get the same thing. So there, there are, there are positives and negatives to that. I think as a currency becomes more and more used, you will find because of the velocity that it, it's begins to stabilize more and more. That's a theory though. I, there, I don't think we have proof of that, but we can see then in currencies, there's a currency that I that I do like. I like Litecoin. Litecoin's a great currency. It's a pretty stable currency. People want to see it go to thousands of dollars. But I'm happy with with using Litecoin, like I'm happy with using Divi. It's in a certain range and and I can transfer that and I get the representative value that I can I can understand. Um that makes sense. If you want it to be stable to the US dollar, that's a, a losing game anyway. Sure. So you would never want to store your dollars just like you want to, you'd want to pick a different storage mechanism, a preservative mechanism than let's say keeping it in the bank. But what you're doing is you're transferring something really quick. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think USDT is expensive um, from a transfer point of view. I, I would probably choose something else because even if you had a small swing in value, uh, the cost in let's say Ethereum you know, your fees there and then using it later are, are, are going to be greater than if you probably chose another currency and sure. had a faster transaction and then a smaller transaction fee, you know, it just depends. I, I, th I think that's one, one of the off. strengths of Divi is that the fees are so low. The transaction speed is, is so fast. Yeah. It makes yeah. a ton of sense, but of course, you know, the receiver is the one who, who requests, uh, which currency I send and, and so course, far USDT course, has yeah. been the go-to. Yeah. USDT is because they want that, they want that peg, which is right. always devaluing anyway, because of inflation, but, um, yes. yeah, that's, that's your USDT is deflating also. So absolutely. That's, uh, that's true. So yeah, you can't, yeah, if somebody wants to be paid in USDT and you want, you want, uh, you want to fulfill that, uh, obligation for them to send you whatever or do the, whatever, then USDT it is. <laughs> You're just going to do that. Right. But in other cases, you can, if you're invoicing, you can say, I'll take this, that, or the other thing. And I encourage businesses, retail businesses, I was doing that for a while, was encouraging retail businesses to be flexible on their take-ins because as a business, you generally are going to have to move it back into at least your local currency of fiat um, and also for taxation. Um, you just take it in as a cash valuation, um, like you would if somebody brought you gold or something and say it's $800 they gave you credit for, and then make sure that you would uh, transfer that immediately. So your swings aren't there like you would normally see that if you held on to something six months and it went up and now you owe taxes on the gain or it went down and then you have a loss, right? And so if you're a business doing that, you don't really want to hold on to the currency. Sure. That's another topic altogether. So tell me about the inflationary aspect of Divi, because we all know with Bitcoin having in the next couple of months, mm -hmm. um, it's driving the value. Uh, we see that the rally that's happening right now, and this, this of course, will be dated in, in the not too distant future, but uh, this being, well, March 1st of, of 2024, uh, yep, there's a yep. lot of buzz about the having coming up, and Divi is inflationary. Although not, it doesn't the the block value isn't cut in half, um, but it the the inflation rate decreases over time. Why yeah, is that I important? The, I think the word that that some other people in the community have used is is that it's disinflationary. Disinflation. It's a made up word. It's kind of like um, impermanent loss, right? It's right. Disinflationary. Um, I think it's important uh, just to recognize the fact that, um, the value itself shouldn't be made just based upon increasing just more. It should be increased upon utility. And the original idea, of course, for Divi was to make sure there was enough Divi in the market from a broad perspective of participants and coin owners for using it as a value transfer, which is what we're talking about, like 
USDT is a value transfer. Ripple is is a value transfer. Divi is a value transfer. Bitcoin is has been manipulated into what people would say is a store of value now, but Satoshi's idea was value transfer. Um, yeah, so so if you, if you have an emission that's too great, it like a fiat currency, it can decrease that value, right? You don't want to just add more just to add more. The differences between adding more and Bitcoin is Bitcoin is limited. Divi, like Ethereum, is not limited, at least currently, um, but you have to do some work to be able to get it, right? So it's not just made out of thin air without having to do something. So um, unlike fiat, which is just print by, no pun intended, fiat by decree, and, uh, and so that's a separate thing. So emissions were made so there could be enough distributed around the world for everyone to have some of it some some value of it or to make it easier to acquire by quantity so when the time comes when utility is in place it's distributed enough that people can then use those utilities that would be true with bitcoin too yeah so that's why the emission rate is high in the early years of divi and then progressively lower and lower to the point where it's pretty pretty um Pretty come. I guess the miners would be very would be very competitive for each other to try to mine those blocks because it will go down quite a bit. To about fifty, I think is. 50, is it fifty? Uh, is the low? I think it's fifty. Well, you know, I'm I'm thinking about when master nodes were in place. I have to look at the chart because we just have the miners now and they get everything. So the validators mining. Right. I don't have it on hand, but yeah, so it's a little bit more, I think. But. So it sounds like what what the Divi project, the Divi blockchain has become is a secure, stable blockchain mm -hmm. that has a good in a good disinflation mechanism built in and definitely and, disinflation. Mm -hmm. And and so it's a platform for developers to begin to create. Now I know in the Divi I guess ecosystem, we've got the foundation, which is controlled by the, the DAO. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that make decisions about the blockchain and some of these issues. Then, mm -hmm. of course, we've got some some third party companies that have done some development around it. We have Divi Labs that created a mobile wallet and mm -hmm. some other tools. We've got um, another company that's created a Divi Go, which is the social media wallet. And so we're starting yeah, to see some partners. WhatsApp wallet. Mm -hmm. The WhatsApp wallet, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we're starting to see some partners come on board the Divi ecosystem and develop things to to um, to work with this blockchain. But Correct. why is why do you feel like the Divi blockchain is worth working with versus some of the other some of the others on the market that might have more adoption currently? Uh, well, when we talk about adoption, we talk about um, more or less press releases. I mean, I mean, there's not really that much adoption that you see in some of these higher value chains. Excuse me. But there is a lot of ownership. Right. And so I think we have two different topics going on, valuation and uh, uh, the appearance of doing certain things can drive emotion, right, and can drive value. And then it can become self-fulfilling because if you and I, if I tell you about my currency – and I own it, and then you buy some, it pushes the price up. So I, you just, you proved me, I'm going to buy some more, and it's going to prove you made a good decision. So I think we have, excuse me, two things that are going on. Adoption with Divi and what's happening in Divi from a utility perspective does do some of the things some of these other blockchains are also attempting to do. That's that's true. I don't know. I don't know of any that are all doing it yet. Um, Divi has a, a philosophical motive that's different than many, and that philosophical motive maintains the sovereignty of the coin owner. And so, when you look at opportunities to build upon Divi, the infrastructure that's being built in what would be three, and then eventually on Divi four with the side chains is going to provide you with the same sorts of utility functions you can find, let's say, 
on an Ethereum virtual machine, it will be able to find similar things that you could find on, let's say, something that would be like a Cosmos, um, but always maintain, maintaining the sovereignty of the coin owner. But even more so than that, maintaining the sovereignty of the blockchain itself. And, and that's key. Um, what Divi is focused on is a non-Oracle-based ecosystem. I remember when I stated earlier, right when we started this and several times in between, anytime you start adding layers of complexity to the blockchain, and then you have either on-chain or off-chain oracleizations or parachains even in that case, um, it can create problems. And so Divi is an ecosystem that I'm involved with, and that's probably why I'm so excited about it because I can see and I can touch and I can debate I can read the code and see the code and see what's going on. And just as any person would, even in your business, the, you may not understand why some business is doing so well until you get into that business and see that business and, and, and start doing your um, analysis on that business and see, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, you don't know, but in your business, when you're looking at your business and somebody says, well, why do you like your business? It's because you and the team you're working with can really stand firmly on the philosophical direction and the technical direction and, and see the vision as it's, it's, it's going to come to be. And so with Divi, I, I've just been blessed to be in the position of having the ability to be an advisor I've been blessed by having the ability to be supported by a community there. I've been blessed to have the ability to do things where um, I can help other community members. It's not just Divi. I do that for other communities too, but Divi specifically. I get blessed by doing those things, but at the same time, I can see and speak and read to the technological changes that are happening. And I can see and I can respect that and not, not just respect it, I can embrace it wholeheartedly because we're all part of it. And I, I could see it in the beginning and how it's happening. And it, and it embodies some of the things that I find important. And, and so, yeah, that's why I think Divi is, for me, um, my best choice of opportunity is, is because there are things built into Divi and being built into Divi that that keeps the end user in charge. And I think that's what cryptocurrency is. In fact, you read Satoshi's right. white paper. The whole goal was everybody being able to participate if they wanted to, but everybody having control over their coins, no intermediary uh, controlling your assets, no tether being tied to the US dollar, which is centralized could be stopped at any time that can happen um there is no entity like that it, it, this is pure freedom based technology i guess is the right word that i would use and that makes sense. the technologies that would be built on it that would be in, in endeared to other technologies maybe some of those technologies adopted use cases we could say um can be built into the divi blockchain in a much different way, but also in a much safer way for the end user. That makes sense. So can you can you talk a little bit more about your comment about maintaining sovereignty over the blockchain? Oh, and yeah. what is like what are some examples that would be opposite of that where there isn't sovereignty? Well, it, there isn't sovereignty when you have situations of other processes, other off-chain situations, um, or other blockchains um, being, let's say, in a parachain situation. You never want to be in a situation unless that parachain is its own parachain, right? So we talk about layer one, layer two, layer three blockchains. That's where one chain might finalize itself on its own chain, but then it's not truly finalized until it's finalized on the lowest chain, if we want to say it from that level, the layer one. The other situations when you get into um, sovereignty of transactions and you have oracleization of processes, 
you put the Oracle as the highest level of authority over said blockchain. And that can be problematic for anyone. Um, and then because it's problematic, then that, that service, whether it's a smart contract or whether it's built into the blockchain, then has to have other processes built into it. Well, what do I keep stressing? More and more you keep adding on to a blockchain to prevent some negative from happening, that introduces more weaknesses while at the same time possibly uh, fixing w the weakness that you're trying or the a attack surface or vector that you're trying to prevent. So anytime you, you take away the sovereignty, let's say, of Bitcoin being the final arbiter of its blockchain, you take that away of any transaction and you put it on, let's say, another blockchain or move it, move it over to another area and that other Oracle doesn't necessarily recognize your transaction to me because maybe it has to be vetted longer. Maybe it has to be validated on its blockchain. Maybe it has to go through the Oracle first. And then the Oracle has its process for revalidating. That happens sometimes. Revalidating a transaction. That you just put Bitcoin under your knee now. It's You're standing on Bitcoin's neck. It doesn't make sense. Bitcoin is its final authority. Divi is its final authority. Other types of blockchains to where you have parachains or para organizations have that same issue, right? You may have a business to where you're a, um, a, a local business owner, let's say of a restaurant and it's a franchise. <laughs> Well, you like doing this. You can't do anything without the franchise's opinion because it's a sort of a para organization. You you bought into that, yes. But in this case, we're talking about assets and freedom, and we're talking about blockchains and sovereignty. When we start building in situations where we put something over something else as the final arbiter, it 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 changes something. And now we have to build in other features and functions that prevent that from happening, which then again, features and functions create other vulnerabilities. So, so yeah, that's not something that I... Just getting really tangible, is that the case with some of these layer two blockchains that are built be. on it Ethereum? Can it can be. You know, anytime you have layer twos, well, let's just talk about smart contracts for a second. This is, we're totally off of Divi, but if we <laughs> want to talk about oracles, I'm happy to. You have to think about how an oracle works. And an oracle can be on-chain or an oracle can be off-chain. It may be a source that a smart contract communicates with. Take sports as an example. So with sports, it doesn't happen often, but how many times have we seen in the Olympics? Or how many times have we seen in college sports? Or for that matter, any sport to where later on somebody is stripped of their title. Right. Well, what happens if you have a smart contract or something that's on a layer two like that and you had a payout and you own a casino, which I don't gamble, but we're just using this as an easy example, an online casino, and you paid out and it's found out that that person was doing something they shouldn't have. They were had steroids or something. Um, you don't find out for months because the testing and all those kinds of things. Well, now what do you do if you're the owner of that online casino? What do you do if you're now the winner? You're not, if you were the winner in the first go around, are you giving back those coins you won? No, no, you spent them already. You, you, you <laughs> said you turned them in the USDT and you bought something overseas. You don't have it anymore. You know, so oracles are not safe. Oracles are something that, um, I think the blockchain itself has a lot of strength and it has a lot of purposes. It has a lot of utility functions that have not even been tapped. When we start talking about a case like that, which is super simple, um, you can see even in the stock exchange, valuations can change dramatically really fast. Now, they try to prevent that because they have such a fast ecosystem there. But um, even in values and market values, it, it can crash, right? It can crash and oracles can become dis not distracted. Now, that doesn't even take into, into play the fact that oracles can also be manipulated because in every system that uses an oracleization, they have elected 
validators who val you know who will who will um work with that oracle itself and those validators now you've put people into positions because there's so few um it's that surface of attack problem you're you're trying to put something in place to make sure that the oracle itself has a sort of a balancing mechanism people who are witnesses to prove that the oracle is correct well what if those witnesses because there's only eight of them and those eight are people like you and i who own and run the machines what if one of those persons is um, not necessarily friendly but malicious? And what if they come together with multiple uh, other validators or witnesses to prove that Oracle is correct? You could really have a – this is not blockchain anymore, right? We're, 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 anytime, again, we add something like that, it gets kind of wonky where we put ourselves in a position that um, bad not just can happen but absolutely will happen. Yeah, I know we're talking about some things that have nothing to do with Divi, but I, nothing, I think yeah. it's relevant because a lot of a lot of Divi holders don't understand why Divi is special and why the fact that we don't have some of these things and the fact that we do have sovereignty over the blockchain and yeah. hold our own coins, why that's important. And, and why that sidechains aren't layer two. Right, because that's one thing. So when Divi uh, implements the side chains, those side chains will have their own features and functions. There will be, you could say, relationships. They'll be bonded, if we want to use that term. And that was Neegs who came up with that term. That means there'll be a relationship, but a side chain doesn't have to prove itself. A side chain, unless, in, unless uh, David, you build it that way. You want you want to bond it to Divi, but then you only want it to finalize a transaction when it's finally mined back into Divi. You could build it like that, but that's not the goal. The goal is just to uh, have children, essentially. You know, so another chain that spawned from or created from validators on Divi, and then those chains may have the utilities. Let's say, well, I know you you engage with businesses, but let's say it's let's say i wouldn't say database but let's say a membership program or something like that something where people will have be issued you know some sort of an id we'll call it an nft in this case because that's an easy thing to envision but let's say it's an id or a membership card you could do those kinds of things on side chains and it won't impede or affect anything on the native chain the origin chain if we want to state it like that um, it doesn't affect that, but it gives you all the freedom and it gives you all the sovereignty on that side chain. It's it's another opportunity. And so that's that's the goodness about it. There's no bridging. There's no a bridge again can be manipulated. It's not quite an oracle, but bridges tend to um lock coins, right? So we talked about getting into contracts. Bridges uh, tend to lock coins and and put them into, let's say, a smart contract. And then make other coins so you can use those other coins uh, in, in, in that ecosystem. And then you can take those coins that you receive and then pull out other coins on the, on the going out. Anytime you have those kinds of situations, it increases the complexity of the situation. And then you have to build in fail safes for those kinds of things. And those security protocols and fail safes all create more security protocols and fail safes. You're always patching once you start adding everything else into it that you think is a good idea it's just not always it doesn't need to happen you can just keep it all on the chain i think is what i'm saying i think we're going to have to have another conversation uh, especially with regards to side chains and subscription sure. capabilities because there's a lot of potential here um what what I'm interested in as well as discussing is this idea that you and I have talked about previous to this conversation about the code itself and the cleanliness oh, yeah. of it and how that may actually facilitate further opportunities for development. Like developing uh, projects around the Divi blockchain is very inexpensive and you've got a great code base to work with. So um Think think we might we might have to have a round two of this discussion. I, I will look forward to it. it. One of the main things about Divi is it's applicable almost ninety nine percent to Bitcoin. So if you if you're really looking to start building, obviously it's more expensive to build on Bitcoin. Um, but if you're looking at building an ecosystem and 
creating an environment where you you have tools that access the blockchain, access the data, maybe do something special with it. It's almost identical, right? I, I told you about the heritage, great, great grandchild of, right? So when you, when you build something on Divi, it, you can almost instantly port it, although the blockchain is different. The way it works, there are so many similarities that it'll work on Bitcoin. But the same case, you can take a Bitcoin project that you're interested in and then port it right to Divi. It's easy to build on because there's so many, so many tutorials, so much external infrastructure, so many online articles so much of what's out there has been out there for 13 14 years it's not new anymore and so there's a lot of information out there i'll leave it with this because we're running out of time um is the blockchain has been completely maybe not completely but we'll say 70 80 percent refactor that's where you kind of take the code that's there and you look at it and is it as clean as it can be? And if the answer is no, you clean it all up, right? And and make it nice. And then there's adding features. And so there's been refactoring and feature adding. One of the great things about Divi's blockchain is its modularity. And so in the version three, which you have on your desktop is most of those features now have each portion of the blockchain on how it works, which you may be interested in when you're building it's modular now, including its communication protocol. So all things are modular. And so you can kind of like with side chains, we'll be finishing most of that and then snapping it in. That's the wow. great thing. It's like a Lego. You can just snap <laughs> it in place. That's the whole goal with modularity. Wow. Well, this has been incredibly helpful. I know it, we've, we've probably gotten a little uh, pithy with our discussion here, but we did. Um, right. <laughs> but that's good. That's, that's actually the goal is, is, you know, we've got this, we've been given this beautiful blockchain and we need to understand what we have so that we can understand what we can do with it. And, uh, hopefully we inspire some, some people to develop some new tools around it. Exactly. Exactly. And the last one, when, when, when Divi, um, uh, the disinflationary mechanism, falls into place it's 166 not 50 it's the lottery that's 50 each block anyway i knew i had 50 right. in there so 166 166 that's <laughs> the number corrected myself <laughs> all right thanks david thank you voice i appreciate your time and and look forward to the next one all right enjoy take care